Data as labor is a concept that's contrast with data as capital. And these are two different economic setups, two different setups of people's rights in the online space, people's rights to the online economy, that we can think about differently and that would shape the way the internet uh, environment unfolds as a way of structuring the internet to be more dignified to people who are using platforms, to workers, to, um, to, to the future of the online environment such that uh, it doesn't favor these huge tech monopolies that just amass more power for themselves. So this video is based on an article that I will link to below. It's super short, you can read it yourself. So first, what do we mean by data? And in the online space, this is going to be things like our likes and clicks on the social media platforms, our time on platform, our preferences, the types of content we're more likely to click on. In an Amazon type of space, this data would be uh, our entire past history of purchasing things, it might include what kinds of websites within uh, Amazon are we spending more time looking at? What products do we seem to be scrolling to the bottom to read the reviews on? That, that's the online data. Now, I think it's also useful as an example to think about medical data because the same concepts could apply to medical data. So when we go and visit a medical system, we're going to generate data, which is what medications are we on? What is our medical history? What are our diagnoses and what are our treatments? So the first difference between data as labor and data as capital is that with data as labor, that data is always owned by the person who generates the data. They can lease out that data just like they lease out their labor, but they never actually sell that data such that it transfers ownership from themselves to one of the big tech monopolies or one of the big hospital systems. They are always the owner. And with data as capital, of course, even if people technically own the rights to their data, they can sell it to those companies and then that data is owned by those companies. It's no longer in the ownership of the person who generated the data. And one of the reasons we need to make this distinction is because, of course, in a lot of environments, you do own your data, but people will just hand over rights to their data um, with the click of a button, without reading the fine print, without even really knowing how companies will use that data, or in particular, without knowing how valuable that data is. And one of the paradigm shifts that's going on here is about the way people think about their own data. So currently, people tend to think of their data as exhaust. It's something that's generated automatically as you interact with websites, as you go about your, your daily life, as you fill out the forms in the medical office. You're just trying to get your doctor's visit. You're just trying to get to content you enjoy. And the data is something you don't even think about. You just generate it automatically. It's viewed as exhaust. And that data as exhaust view is in this uh, data as capital model. In the data as labor model, people are more aware of the value of their data. So they, they actually know, oh, if I actually give this data to say a collective that can use it and lease it out to these big companies, then I can either make money or I can uh, exert power. And of course, all of this needs to be um, done through some kind of collective. Because one weird thing about data is that the marginal value of my data depends how many people my data is clustered with. If my data is clustered with nobody, then it's not valuable at all. But if it's clustered with a thousand people, it has some value. If it's clustered with 10,000 people and a million people, then the individual value of my personal data is much, much more valuable. So almost certainly this data as labor model is going to have to involve some kind of data union or collective. So probably the biggest outcome difference between these two models is that the data as capital model empowers these big tech monopolies. 
it leads to these companies getting more and more power over time as they siphon our data from us. Whereas the data as a labor model is empowering to the people who generate that data uh, in, in whatever way they generate it, whether it's automatically generated by your use of online content or whether it's intentionally generated so that you are trying to improve the algorithms or trying to improve the online space in ways that are consistent with your values, in ways that you can be proud of. And that's actually a unique feature of data as labor, is that of course labor involves incentivizing people to use their labor productively. So right now, um, the big tech monopolies do not want people to think about the value of their, their data. So they're not going to try to incentivize us to generate better data unless those incentives are sort of under the radar and incentives that we're not going to notice. Whereas in the data as a labor model, we could be intentional about getting people to improve the quality of data that we generate. And an example here might be the data generated by diabetics. So obviously diabetics would like their data to be used to improve treatments, to improve the body of knowledge about managing diabetes. That's a good thing. That's a win-win for medical companies and the data generators. But with data as labor, you could actually say, um, if you put forth the effort of tracking your sleep and tracking your diet and tracking your, your habits of when you wake up and, and when you go to bed and how much sunlight you get and how much social interaction you get, if you track these things that might be useful for figuring out how to best manage diabetes, then you're going to benefit financially by contributing that data in a way that's more pro-social. And in the current data as capital model that we're under, people don't have that much incentive to put a lot of effort into generating good data unless it's personally beneficial to them. Now, I could imagine some people generating all of this personalized data just for the fun of it. There are some people that just love tracking themselves. But for a lot of people, that's not worth the effort. And in the data as labor model, um, they could be incentivized either financially or in other ways to be intentional about generating higher quality data. Another type of data I could actually imagine us incentivizing is data about people's skills. So for example, um, one thing that I think is a hopeful thing in the medical community is health coaches. And health coaches are not nurses or doctors. They're not medically trained. They're people who are in the community who understand the culture and the habits and the patterns of that community such that they can inspire people to take better care of their health. They can help people manage their diabetes, help people manage their chronic illness through a relationship where they communicate with that person in an inspiring way. So there are uh, health coaches being used in different pockets of the medical system, but how do you choose these health coaches? Because a lot of times these are people who used to work at McDonald's, used to work at the grocery store. They're not trained professionals. So how do you know who's going to be good at motivating others in their community? Because not everybody's good at that. But if you could sort of put out data saying, I believe these five people in my community would be good as health coaches. And if you could eventually get some sort of financial payoff or some sort of even just knowledge that your recommendations about who has those skills matched up with other people's experience. Maybe um, these people took up that job and they're very effective at motivating people to lose weight or stop smoking. If your predictive powers can actually be used productively, you should get some cut of the benefit of that. And that's the thing that data as labor at least opens up the opportunity that something like that could be, could be done. So in the data as capital model, there's a lot of worry that workers will be eliminated, that we won't need people to be productive anymore, that the only thing people can be is consumers. 
They can't be sources of value to others. And um, this article actually says that's a universal basic income sort of way of viewing things that people, people are no longer of value, so we need to just give them money because they can be consumers, they cannot be valuable as producers. And one critique people have of u universal basic income is that it's, it's not very dignified. Some people will say it's paying workers to go away, to say, we don't want you in the, in the economic system, just go away and we'll pay you to just go do your own thing. Uh, you don't have any value to offer this new system of the future. In the data as labor model, we're recognizing that actually those people have a lot of value um, to, to the online environment. They have a lot of value to artificial intelligence because in fact, artificial intelligence could not do most of what it does without those people's data. They actually are producers. And if we open their eyes to the fact that they are essential to the online economy and give them the rights to what they produce, then um, we, we suddenly create a dignified way for them to contribute to the, the economy of artificial intelligence. And of course, another worry people have about UBI is that whoever controls the pocketbook of UBI, whoever gets to decide how much people get, they can have all of these stipulations. Like that control over the disbursement of UBI, could potentially be abused or used in an authoritarian way. Whereas if people have control over the data they generate, which is necessary for artificial intelligence, then they have power to, to negotiate against that centralized uh, distributor of UBI. The data as labor model creates this new class of jobs, which could be jobs just generating quality data that can be useful for artificial intelligence. Now, a few other things the article pointed out. One is that this isn't a binary setup. It, we could be on a spectrum where certain online environments do a better job of moving toward data as labor as a, as a legal framework and maybe, maybe that doesn't have to be moving the entire economy over to this model at once. But if you can find um, little sectors of the online economy that you can actually make this happen with, that will be empowering to workers and that will be empowering to people in a way that we might hope could eventually move, move a greater and greater share of the economy over to being controlled by the people. The article emphasizes the fact that uh, the large tech monopolies, which uh, the article refers to as the siren servers, they, they really don't want people to notice how much value their data has, and so they do everything to keep that out of what I would call the salience frame of people.